Feel free to keep your Bibles open this morning in Mark chapter 1, verses 1 to 20. Hear the word of the Lord. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, after me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I, will make, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called to them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired hands and followed him. This is God's word. Amen. You may be seated. We all tell stories. We tell stories about um, where we came from. Uh, families have their stories. Uh, stories about uh, grandmother and uh, grandfather and what we did at the lake that summer. And cultures have stories. Countries have stories where this culture has come from, where this country has come from. And, and, and stories have certain, a certain shape to them. That they, uh, there's obviously a beginning, a middle, and an end. And there are different kinds of stories. Some uh, narrative uh, scholars who analyze uh, narratives have decided there are certain sorts of archetypal stories. Um, uh, Different scholars have different ideas about how many there are. Some think there are six or what have you, but it seems clear there are different structures that you can analyze behind stories. It's one of the reasons why many of us find the, 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 the sort of classic Hollywood blockbuster a little predictable. You know, at the end, the hero is going to get in a fight with a bad guy. It's got to be a fist fight or something like that. But, but a little more than that, there are, there are, there's the rags to riches, classic story. It can be the other way around, of course, riches to rags. Uh, there, there's the, the, the story that tells how things went well and then went down and then came up again. The man in the hole kind of story. It doesn't have to be a man, it doesn't have to be a hole, but it's that sort of story. And we all tell stories about our own lives. Uh, and those stories shape who we think we are. Uh, th th they become an architecture, a framework for interpreting data. The same is true, of course, in the religious realm. Someone says Jesus, 
And the person who has a sophisticated view of how the Bible fits together will put that name Jesus within that story. But for many people, uh, Jesus is a bumper sticker. Uh, they, they don't know much about him. Much less about Christianity, and even that is a sort of abstract term. What do we mean the culture of Christianity, the doctrine of Christianity, the message of Christianity? What's the story? And the story we tell in the religious realm is sometimes a reflection of the story we tell about our own lives. There's an architectural shape to how we interpret what we hear. Put that into concrete terms, practically. I, I was amused to discover there was a, a, a story about a, something of an architectural fail, a, a, a residential house called St. Bennett's. Back, I think it was in the 1960s or something like that, uh, the residents of that house decided that they needed a new boundary around the house, a new, uh, a new barrier, a new fence, a new wall, and so, of course, they put it out to bid, and the architects came along and decided how they were going to build it, and then the construction people came in, and the trucks moved in, and they started to build it, and they finished the work, and then with all the, the trucks still there on the site, having finished the, the wall or the fence around this, this residential house in Bennett's, they suddenly realized that there had been rather a big error made. There was no gate. And so, you know, the next morning they came along and knocked down some of the wall and put a gate in, and the trucks happily uh, drove out. Well, sometimes, uh, in the more... Uh, outside of the physical or the physical architecture, the, the architecture of a story of our lives, we can find the same. We can feel like we're stuck. Something happened to us, and it feels like the story is going down. The same can be true in cultures. They can lose their confidence. Where are we going? How do we get out of this? Is there a good end to the story? Or was it just getting worse? One of the privileges of being a Christian is that we have a big story. It is a story that we reenact every Sunday when we gather together as a church. It's a story within which we who are Christians are constantly being reinvited to live within, to interpret life through. And yet so often that story is being forgotten, atomized, broken down, the frame, the architecture, the narrative is being lost. So people don't know how to interpret the data about God or Jesus or sin or suffering or the church. It just feels random. And so at College Church over the next uh, little while, we are going to spend time looking at the story as Mark, or one of the early manuscripts, tells that story. And we are going to have fairly big chunks. We just had a fairly big chunk of the, of the Bible read out for us so that we can get a sense of the story and how it fits and what the message is. And, and, and when Mark tells the story, every time he's telling it, he's also inviting us to answer what we think. Do we agree? Are we going to enter in? One way of analyzing what Mark's gospel is about is about two themes, identity, that is who Jesus is, and then mission, that is what do we think? Will we join in the mission? 
This is why some scholars talked about Mark as having a uh, messianic secret. It's really not a messianic secret. That's to misunderstand what Mark's doing. What Mark is doing is he's constantly saying, what do you think? What's the answer to the question of who Jesus is? Will you enter the story? Will you join the mission? And in this introductory passage, this part of the story we're looking at this morning, Mark has fundamentally an issue of time at the heart of what he's saying. What he's saying is that wilderness times have gone. Uh, the bad times, the sinful times, the wrong times, the alienated times, the desert times, the times of no blessing, wilderness times have gone. Gospel times, good news times, they've arrived. And then he, uh, he looks out at us, out of the page, out of the story and says, well, will you join in? And you say, well, why should I listen to this? Let me just give you a couple of reasons why before we get into the text itself. First of all, many of us perhaps feel like we're in a wilderness. We feel like our story is stuck. We're not sure what the end point is. We're not sure where it's going. We, we can't get out of it. So here's a story that's going to tell you how to get out of it. And then there are those of us who are looking for a sense of purpose and meaning and, and commission and mission. And again, this is going to help us with that. So let's look at the story together. And as we see... Uh, Mark's uh, gospel here in these first uh, 20 verses is basically structured around three characters. There's John, of course, John the Baptist, and then there's Jesus, who comes from Nazareth, and then the third character, as it were, uh, is, uh, the, 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 are the disciples. And, and, and the way that Mark is telling the story, you've got John, you've got Jesus, and then he looks out of the, uh, of, of the text at us, uh, his readers, and says, well, what about us? What about you? So there's John, there's Jesus, and there's us, our response to what he's saying about this time that the wilderness times have ended and the gospel times are here. Or what about you? Well, this is what happened to James and Andrew and, and, uh, and, and Simon and John, but what about, what about us this morning? And, and so that's, the, that's the, 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 the structure of the passage and therefore the structure of the message. But Mark's gospel, we need to make sure we understand how it fits in. I just did it very briefly in terms of the, 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 the question and the, the answer that Mark gives. And, that, 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 and he introduces this right at the beginning in Mark chapter 1, verse 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And that claim that Jesus is the Son of God is the one that he's going to explore, that Jesus is divine. And that's why you get in verse 11, the voice comes from heaven, you are my beloved son. He is the son of God. God himself says it. And he explores that until the end of the gospel, Mark chapter 15, and when Jesus is on the cross being crucified, the Roman centurion looks at Jesus and says, surely this is son of God. The first time a human says Jesus is son of God. And so as we go through the story all, all over, over and over again, all the time, it's been asked this question, who do we say he is? Is he the Son of God? What do we think? And Mark is going to show us why we, we can believe that he is the Son of God, just like the Roman centurion did. And even in polytheistic, pluralistic, syncretistic times like ours, with many different gods that people follow, many different ideologies, like Roman times, with all their polytheism and syncretism and all their different gods, it's a Roman centurion who says, surely, son of God. And Mark wants us to come to the same conclusion. And so then in this first uh, uh, passage, as I said, there are these three characters. There's John, and uh, he uh, comes uh, baptizing where? In the wilderness. This has been prophesied in, in Isaiah, and he's a fulfillment of this message, and he's, 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 he's preaching a message that is pointing to Jesus. He says, verse 7, after me comes one who is mightier than an eye. He's fulfilling all the prophecy of Isaiah that he's preparing the way for the Lord, that is for Jesus, making his path straight. And he's in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, and that baptism happens where, verse 5, where? In the Jordan. So what? What? 
what Mark is saying as he tells this story about John is that John is in the wilderness deliberately, and he's calling God's people to go through the Jordan to the promised land. What he's saying is, you God's people at the time when he's preaching, you think you've come back from exile, you think you've returned, but actually you're still in the wilderness. The Messiah has not yet come, but I'm going to show you who he is any moment. And so the wilderness times that they were in, there needs to be a new exodus. They've got to come out of the wilderness, through the Jordan, into the promised land. And John is preaching, pointing to Jesus in fulfillment of the Scriptures. And that, my friends, is what preachers are to do. Every preacher, in one way or another, is to be a little bit of a John the Baptist. A preacher is to have the Bible open and then point to him. That's not you up there in the balcony, but Jesus. That's what a preacher does. We're all little John the Baptists. A preacher is not a proponent of a particular philosophy that they've made up out of their own head. A preacher is not a dispenser of best life advice. A preacher is not to pontificate about the economy or politics. Our calling is to preach Christ out of the Scriptures. And I'm emphasizing that because today so many Christians, so many churches, I'm afraid to say, seem to have forgotten that. I did some research uh, uh, on this this week to verify the um, veracity of this anecdote, this story. Um, Back in 1984, a, a Polish pastor uh, received an honorary doctorate from a Christian college, and he told this story, and so I think it is real. In Warsaw, in Poland, after World War II, that city, as some of you know, was absolutely devastated during World War II, and buildings were smashed down all over the place, much like you see today in the pictures in some of the cities in the country of Ukraine. Absolute devastation, hardly a building. There are a few left, but very few left. And uh, this pastor told the story that there was one wall and one part of one wall still standing of the Bible Society in the city of Warsaw and Poland after World War II. And on that wall, amazingly, was the following text. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Listen, my friends. God's Word, with all the criticism and attacks that have been thrown out of it, will not pass away. And so we take our stand there as a church. So there's John, but then comes Jesus. Uh, Verse 9, of course, in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John, where? In the Jordan. But think about that for a moment. He's, Jesus is baptized by John. Surely there is hardly a more extraordinary statement in the Scriptures. John's baptism is a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus, the sinless one, is repented by John, is baptized by John. Jesus neither needs to repent nor is he a sinner, and yet he's baptized. Why? Well, part of it, of course, is to set us an example that we too should be baptized. If you haven't yet been baptized, here's the example of Jesus himself. If Jesus went into the waters of baptism, then surely you should. So it's partly to set an example, but it's more than that. It's also to teach us in this beginning part of the story that Jesus is an advocate for sinners, that he's a substitute for sinners, that he was baptized as a sinner, though he is not a sinner. 
for sins, though he did not sin, so that in him we might have the righteousness of God. And as he's baptized to indicate this, there's a divine approval. The heavens are open, the Spirit descends on him like a dove. Why like a dove? Because almost certainly, of course, the dove goes back to Noah when uh, the, uh, the waters had uh, receded and God's judgment was over, and the dove is, is a symbol of peace, peace between God and us. And so Jesus, who's the substitute for sinners, now there is peace that we can have access to. There's the dove of peace that descends on him, and a voice comes from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased, to affirm that Jesus is divine, but also to teach us that if we believe in Jesus, we may have the same peace the same approval, the same experience of God's love, that God looks at anyone in Christ and says, I love you, and I'm pleased with you. If you put your trust in Christ, you have divine approval that cannot be taken away. He delights, that's the sense of the word, He delights in you. You are my child, and I love you. And then uh, we're told that Jesus is immediately driven where? Into the wilderness. Because Jesus will engage in cosmic battle with the forces of darkness, with Satan himself, for 40 days. For the 40 years that the Israelites wandered in the wilderness, and failed time and time and time again. Those 40 days, Jesus is there and not failing and being righteous and being the son that Israel was always meant to be. Now Jesus is. And then he's with the wild animals and the angels were ministering to him. It's a very mystical part of the text and there are different opinions. In my view, what's being said here is after the victory that Jesus is going to have with Satan, finally fulfilled at the cross, of course, there's a new paradise to come where even creation that right now is groaning as we sang earlier will be at peace too. And then uh, Jesus comes out and preaches the gospel saying, the time is fulfilled. And the kingdom of God is hand, repent and believe in the gospel. There is a new time now. It's no longer wilderness time. It's gospel time. What does the gospel mean? We throw it around. Of course, we got it on our steeple proclaiming the gospel. What does the word gospel mean? Its background is both Hebrew and um, it, it connects to the, the Roman background as well. In the Hebrew background, the, the word gospel is used in the, in the Greek translation of the Hebrew in the Old Testament simply for an announcement of good news. You can read about this in 1 Kings where there's a messenger being waiting to tell the king something not particularly religious or spiritual, but he's coming to tell him good news, and the word is used the same word here. He's coming to tell him a gospel. It's an announcement of good news. That's what the word means. And same in Isaiah chapter 40, where that's used rep repetitively, which is the background to much of Mark's gospel. And of course, this particular chapter as well, as the first couple of verses indicate, that word gospel is used over and over again, that there will be a herald, someone who will announce Good news, that's the Hebrew background. It's saying the king is here. That's why the kingdom of God is, ha is at hand, is near. Why is the kingdom of God near when Jesus preaches? Because the king is here. That's why the kingdom of God is at hand. He, the king, is there. It's right there. He is, in a sense, the kingdom as he is the temple. And in him, we are in the kingdom, which is why the kingdom is come and yet is also yet to come because Jesus has arrived and he is yet to return as well. And then in the pagan connection, in the pagan world, the word gospel was used of the emperor cult when they had an emperor who was born or claimed and then ascended in their sort of theoretical uh, religious ideas and was acclaimed as divine, the acclamation was called a gospel. And so what Mark is saying, what Jesus is saying as he preaches, is that the fulfillment, the time is fulfilled of the king in the Old Testament has come, and that fulfillment is giving us a real gospel, 
not that fake pagan Roman gospel. There's a real king here, and there's the real son of God here, and his name is Jesus. And there are lots of other stories that we have today about gospels, aren't there? Cultural gospels, political gospels, psychological gospels. But we have the gospel. Wilderness times have ended. Gospel times are here. I, I wonder in the narrative of your life, and I asked myself the same question when I was uh, very moved earlier as we were singing that song, Is He Worthy? And I was thinking about that and praying about that as we were singing it, asking myself the same question. In the narrative of our lives, I wonder what time we think it is. Wilderness times? Or gospel times. Yeah, there was a French scientist called Michel Cifre who conducted a rather unusual experiment uh, some years back. He was investigating the way in which uh, the body had its own biorhythms and he wanted to find out to what extent the body's internal clock would keep time with our external clocks. And so what Michel Cifre did as he's investigating time was he, he, he shut himself up in a cave where there was no external light whatsoever and he had no means of telling the time through any clock or watch or phone or anything like that and he shut himself up there for two months and he kept a journal of his experience. And in that journal he found that increasingly he lost touch with time. He thought only a few hours had passed when actually 36 hours had passed. When they eventually took him out of the cave, as arranged on September the 20th, according to Michel Seifert's journal, it was only August the 19th. It's a fascinating experiment, though when I discovered it, I, I did ask myself whether he could have found out the same thing by standing in line one afternoon at the DMV. <laughs> but nonetheless, what time? I don't mean, you know, is it almost lunchtime? I mean, what, what time are you living in? What kind of times? The best of times? The worst of times? There are all these narratives out there telling us it's this kind of time. It's a, a, a time of decline, or it's a ki time of optimism, or it's a time... What kind of time are we living? As Christians, we're above all that? We're beyond all that? We, we march to the beat of gospel time. You say, well, what does that mean? How do I put that into practice? Well, the text itself tells us, verses 16 to 20. Jesus, uh, as Mark tells the story, he comes to Simon and Andrew, verse 16. He calls them to follow him, and then to James and John, and calls them to follow him. They, 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 they enter into a complete commitment, and they become fishers of men, which, of course, is to be evangelists and, and disciple-makers of people rather than to... Uh, fish, fish, they're now fishing people. And as then Mark is telling the story, the point of this, I think, is having set up wilderness time, gospel time, he now says, now look, there's a needed response. And the response that Jesus is looking for is to follow him with this complete commitment and then to fish for him, to join in. Everyone who's a Christian is a minister. We all have a ministry. We're all called to fish, to go out and make disciples. Will you follow Jesus this morning? In the family of the church, like James and Andrew and Simon, this multicultural, multi-age family of the church, as Jesus is calling us to do. And fish, tell others about him. Uh, we had a Christianity Explored class this morning as people were getting ready to launch a new one, which is a, a means to encourage people to find out more about Jesus. You might like to email uh, the staff about that and find out how to get involved. That'd be one way to do it. To be a person who's consciously 
on the lookout for who you can encourage to follow Jesus just a little bit closer, how you can use your business for Jesus, your family for Jesus, your home for Jesus, how you can get involved serving as you follow and fish. But it all depends upon entering into the reality of the story as Mark is unfolding it for us, that we're now living in gospel times. I, I, I came across um, this remarkable um, uh, story this week. One of the most famous uh, photographs ever taken, it won the Pulitzer Prize back in 1972, was a photograph of a, of a young nine-year-old girl running towards the camera and running away from devastation and bombs. And she was clearly scarred and burnt. And the, the, she was called Napalm Girl. And it, it won the Pulitzer Prize. It's a, if, if you know photographic journalism, you'll know about that photograph. It's a remarkable photograph. And as I say, it won the Pulitzer Prize. But I'd lost track of this completely. And I had just assumed that this little girl, whoever she was, had, had died very sadly. But no. She's alive. She's now 59 years old. A few years back, someone invited her to church. This neighbor of hers had been saying to her over and over again, you are loved. She couldn't believe it. And then finally, one Christmas, she opened her heart and accepted Jesus. This is what she says. She says, I am no longer a victim of war. Imagine that, all she's been through. But now she has a different story. I am no longer a victim of war. She says, I am a friend, I am a helper. I imagine she feels that she's gifted at helping people. She says, I am now an agent of peace. The Spirit of God like a dove. All of that is gospel time. So let's join in. Will you pray with me? Oh Lord God, we thank you for uh, Mark and this uh, gospel that we're looking at this morning. We pray as we do it in, uh, week by week that you would inspire and motivate us to follow you. We pray that, Lord, you would be glorified through it all. We pray this morning that those of us here who are not yet following you, you by your Spirit, Lord, would you work in their hearts now to cause them to give their lives to you and follow you just like James and Andrew and Simon, John. And we pray, Lord, that we would all be this morning commissioned to fish for you, to go out and make disciples, to serve. But most of all, Lord, I pray that we will be, whether starting for the first time or returning, that we would live with this narrative that the wilderness times are gone and the gospel times are here. Help us then as a church to proclaim that gospel. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.